Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. It's great to have you all here. I'm going to dive straight into the presentation and start with the key regulatory changes that have happened this year, principally focusing on wireless devices and their relevant schemes. I will go through the changes region by region, moving from west to east, starting with LATAM, USA and Canada, then moving on to the EMEA region and some EU and UK changes that occurred. Charlotte will then be back to join us to discuss changes in APAC and CIS regions and finalising the webinar with a slide on cybersecurity. As we move through the webinar, if you have any questions at all, please type them into the question tool at the side of your screen. We should have time to answer a few questions at the end of the presentation, but any we don't have time for, we will make a note of and email you after we have finished the session today. So let's begin with the regulatory updates that occurred this year in the LATAM region starting with Argentina. Later this year, ENACOM, the Argentinian Wireless Authority, updated the local testing standards for digital broadband systems and frequency hopping through various resolutions. The standard applies to most wireless devices with digital modulation or frequency hopping techniques in the frequency bands you can now see on the slide. As a consequence, renewal processes, including these technologies, will require retesting in country in order to obtain the, rene the renewed approval certificate. Another change is the expansion of the band allocation for LPR radars operating in the 78 to 81 gigahertz band. The resolution includes a new technical standard you can see on your screen for these radars, which came into effect in August this year. It is worth mentioning that applications are accepted with a declaration of conformity until at least one local laboratory is accredited for testing under the new standard. Labeling guidelines have also been updated to include further options for label locations when the device is installed inside a vehicle and when marking cannot be placed directly on the product due to construction, size or packaging restrictions. Uh, next up, we have Brazil where the Brazilian regulator Anatel joined other telecom authorities helping operators and service providers on the tra transition from 2G and 3G networks to 4G and 5G technology in order to promote a more efficient use of the spectrum and promote more advanced technological standards. Along the year, different acts have been released. Amongst the most relevant we can mention, publication of the new Act 17087 that updated the electrical safety standard for telecom devices, and at the end of last year, introducing changes on marking requirements, acoustic shock testing levels, definitions and standards. In April, Anatel released the Act 5159 for new mobile phone charger requirements. The new regulation includes changes in EMC testing for vehicle chargers and new mechanical testing for wall chargers plugs. Act 7971 introduced new IPv6 testing requirements for telecommunication products introducing changes for W1 modules and other requirements. In March 2023, the same regulator established requirements on cybersecurity for the certification of custom premises equipment used to connect subscribers to the internet service providers network. This regulation adds another layer to their cybersecurity regulation already in place since 2021. Next up, we have Mexico. In May this year, the Mexican Secretary of Economy revoked the temporary measures for importing products due to the impact of COVID-19. Therefore, several regulations related to the importation of goods subject to compliance with official Mexican standards were revoked. Also in May at the SE, there was a revision of the old 2018 guidelines where they modified the surveillance process for safety renewals. The new regulation requires two follow-up visits for testing in the renewal process for NOM 003. Mexico has also introduced draft guidelines for the use of the IFT label for approved telecommunication or broadcasting products, aiming to add a recognisable logo to the marking or labelling and to establish the specifications and requirements of said label. In September, the Federal Institute of Telecommunications published the official modification of NOM 221 Part 3 that mainly affected alert messages in mobile terminal equipment, prohibiting their use outside the regulated list, requiring channels to be enabled and activated through MMI codes provided by the ETM manufacturers. Also, display format must be verified by digital radio communication simulators. 
Next is the current and recent update. The Mexican regulator is running a public consultation on local area radio networks radio communication equipment that uses the digital modulation technique and that operates in the bands now listed on the screen. The consultation will be open for comments until January the 29th next year. Let's now turn our attention to Bolivia. The Telecom Authority published a resolution introducing changes on the current type of approval regulation. The resolution now requires applicants to provide a web link to verify or download the documents submitted as part of the type approval application. Examples and links would be to the FCC database or to the manufacturer's own sites. This means that manufacturers looking to certify under a certain level of confidentiality would not be able to do so. Previously released approval certificates are still valid until their expiry date. Moving now to Peru where the Peruvian RF Authority, Ministry of Transport and Communications, released a new national frequency allocation plan, introducing frequency bands that will allow the development of mobile technologies such as 4G and 5G, high altitude platforms, and use of television white spaces, improving wireless coverage in the home and more. For Trinidad and Tobago in, in September this year, the Telecommunications Authority issued the final document on telecommunication equipment standardization and certification framework after several consultations. This document aims to streamline and modernize processes. The main effect is that certificates issued five or more years ago will have just become invalid since the 1st of December this year and will now be required to be renewed, so do check your certifications for Trinidad and Tobago. Let's now move on to one of the big topics in North and South America, which is Wi-Fi 6E. Several LATAM countries have updates on this technology, so let's start with El Salvador. The Telecom Authority CGET updated their national frequency allocation table, allocating the 6 GHz frequency band 5925 to 7125 MHz. After several consultations regarding this technology, Mexico is now another country enabling the use of Wi-Fi 6E. In March, the IFT authority established the technical operating conditions of band 5925 to 6425 MHz. When Peru updated their national frequency allocation plan this year, the plan included improving wireless coverage of Wi-Fi 6E. This update enables unlicensed access to the whole 6 GHz band for Wi-Fi, improving the wireless coverage. In May, the Argentinian regulator allocated the 6 GHz frequency range for Wi-Fi 6E, establishing the technical conditions for the band listed on the slide now and aligning the country with the trends of the LATAM region. As you can see on the slide, we have put together LATAM countries that accept Wi-Fi 6E and under which bands and which countries now allocate Wi-Fi 6E as of 2023. Before we move on from the LATAM region, I wanted to cover regulatory changes to USA and Canada, so the FCC and I said changes over the course of this year. For those of you who don't know what an automated frequency control is, it's a method similar to dynamic frequency selection for 5 GHz WLAN equipment, which are given authorization to transmit on clear channels to accommodate existing equipment within the 6 GHz band. A better system was needed here due to multiple devices being found illegally operating by market surveillance having DFS hacks. I said, as an example, have already authorized several databases for such usage. However, there are currently no real-world AFC systems to test the requirements of FCC and ISED for standard power 6 GHz WLAN devices. Wi-Fi Alliance, however, have created an AFC test harness that mimics the functionality of an AFC to assist in the certification of 6SD and 6FC devices. In August of this year, the FCC released a new regulation which mentions the standard power devices that are now open for certification. These cover access points and standard and fixed client devices falling under 6SD and 6FC. In September and October this year, the FCC and I said both released regulations providing a waiver for certain devices. This waiver means it's now possible to avoid current dedicated short range communication rules to allow the use of cellular vehicle to everything devices in the upper 30 megahertz proportion prior to the adoption of CV2X rules. This equipment operating under the provisions of the waiver 
orders would operate in the 5905 to 5925 MHz band using a single 20 MHz channel. Applications are subject to pre-approval guidance since it's under waiver. Additionally, ICE had released a consultation on the new version of RSS 102, which closed in September this year, but I said are aiming to both simplify and improve the mechanism by which manufacturers and CBs utilise standards and supplementary procedures to demonstrate compliance for RF exposure. Modernisation will likely take a couple of years to fully implement an interim solution. Information will move to specific annexes of RSS 102. The publication of the standards is expected in late time this year, 2023, early 2024, so do look out for these. FCC and ISED have adopted the ANSI C6310 2020 for unlicensed wireless devices. The ANSI C6310 2023 replaces ANSI C6310. But a transition period of two years is provided, during which time either edition may be used for demonstrating compliance with ISED requirements. After the transition period expires, new certifications shall use ANSI C63-2023. Next, we're going to be moving on now to the EMEA region. So let's start with Botswana, where the Botswana Communications Regulatory Authority began the year discussing their plans of renewing the current type approval guidelines, procedures and technical specifications of communications equipment in the country. In March this year, they issued draft copies of these new guidelines and more recently had discussions with stakeholders on the changes to come. Some examples are changes to the certification fees, uh, the new type approval system, shorter lead times when it comes to the certification process and a new exemptions list with products such as receive only devices. TUVSUD will continue to monitor the situation and update all of our clients as these changes develop. Moving on now to Egypt, where the most important change was from the National Telecom Regulatory Authority, who published an outdated type approval procedure in June this year. This is really important as the number of type approval schemes has reduced to three schemes, removing what's called the guided scheme that was in place, which is applicable for products manufactured in Egypt. Next up, we have Iraq. And the most important change was in June this year, the Communications and Media Commission um, in the country issued a type approval regulation, which now allows family approvals. In order for products to be classed as a family, they have to share the same technical specifications and reports. Ivory Coast. A quick yet important update for Ivory Coast back in March was that the Telecommunications Authority announced that samples are no longer required for new or renewal type approval applications. And while we're on the topic of samples, in February, the communications agency in the Republic of Congo now require samples for all devices. Let's now turn our attention to Jordan. In May this year, the Jordanian Permanent Technical Committee for Energy Efficiency and Management issued a draft technical regulation establishing eco-design requirements for different products, including electronic displays, light sources, and some household appliances. In October, the same authority released guidelines on the use of radio frequency allocated for short range devices. On the slide, you will now be able to see some of the updates to these guidelines. Next up is Q8. In July, the Communication and Information Technology Authority issued a resolution suspending the importation of telecommunication terminal devices that operate on 2G and or 3G networks in the country. This is really important to be aware of, as we believe a lot of countries will be implementing sorry, this change and phasing out 2G and 3G to make way for 4G, 5G and maybe even 6G networks. This shift will have an impact on the functionality of devices running on older standards and will impose new testing and certification requirements. So do be on the lookout for these changes. TUVSU will also be analysing this very closely, so we'll update you on all of our platforms when these changes start to occur. Moving on now to Amman, where we saw a number of important changes this year. Similarly to Q8, the Telecom Authority announced the termination of 2G and 3G services beginning in Q3 of next year, and also announced a new requirement for mobile phones to support voice over LTE from the 1st of April this year. In June, 
the Telecommunications Regulatory Authority issued a new regulation, number N89-2022, about the provision of tracking in geolocation system services in the country. This came into effect immediately. Oman is also issued a number of public consultations next year. The first one was in July on the, use, on the use of millimetre wave spectrum. The portal is currently undergoing maintenance, so access to public consultations is currently limited, but um, we're hoping the authority portal will, will be updated very soon. The authority opened another consultation in August on 11 annexes related to implement, implementing regulation, organising registration, utilisation of frequencies and radio equipment and pricing. Then the last important consultation was in September regarding the authority's plans to amend the current type approval regulations with TRA decision number 59 slash 2015. Once TubeSuit have updates on all these regulation changes, we'll be sure to inform you. So next up we have Saudi Arabia. In April 2023, the Communication Space and Technology of Saudi Arabia published the information memorandum for the specialised radio network licence in the 450 MHz band. The main objective is to allocate the 450 MHz radio licence to help initiate a national specialised communications network for the various national sectors. Then finally in August, the CST and SASO, the Saudi Standards Metrology and Quality Organisation, announced the decision of unifying charging ports for mobile phones and electric, electronic devices to USB type C in line with the EO. Next up, we're gonna discuss South Africa. So close to the beginning of the year in February, the ICASA RF Authority launched a consultation for three radio frequency spectrum assignment plans for international mobile telecommunication systems. Following this, in the April, they published the final plans for IMT450, IMT850, and IMT1500. Another important update here was in May, where the ICASA Authority published an amendment to Annex B of the Radio Frequency Spectrum, Spectrum Regulations 2015. This amendment opens the lower 6 GHz frequency band 5925 to 6425 MHz for Wi-Fi. Additionally, the 122 to 246 gigahertz frequency band has been incorporated for non-specific short range applications. EMC and safety requirements for relevant applications will remain mandatory and refer to the standards laid out in ICAS's official list of regulated standards. Lastly, for South Africa, it is currently in dis uh, discussions with ICASA to assign certification bodies to carry out an initial review of type approval applications before the application then goes to the authority for the final approval. Their work is currently underway to develop this requirement, so we should be seeing some further updates about this moving into 2024. Our GMA team will be keeping you updated on all of these changes, so you are prepared for the certification in this country. Let's now move on to discuss Tunisia. The Tunisian Authority, CERT, published an updated National Frequency Allocation Plan in June this year. The main changes concern the non-specific SRDs without voice transmission, the induction of loop devices and the output power of 25 milliwatts and the geolocation and motion detection devices. Moving on quickly to UAE. The UAE regulator TDRA updated their type approval labelling format for approved products. Please see the slide now, which shows you the new updated versions of these labels. When certifying your products with TubeSeed, we will make sure to send you labeling information when sending out the type approval certificates. Finishing off now with Zambia, where the most important update was in April this year, where the Zikta Authority permitted the 700 megahertz band, as well as the 2600 megahertz band. More details on frequencies can be now seen on the slide. So now it's time to dive into the regulatory updates in the European Union and the United Kingdom. In the UK, CE mark recognition has now been indefinitely extended for certain product categories. This extension is an intent by the Department for Business and Trade and is not yet legislated. However, it's essential to be aware that compliance with other legislations might still be required as some products fall outside this indefinite extension. Turning now to the EU, who issued Directive 2022 over 
22380, sorry, which amends the RED Directive and primarily focuses on charging capability requirements. Changes to Article 17 offer manufacturers the choice of compliance modules A, B or H. Notably, for charging capability, the use of a notified body is now optional. Requirements also include the use of USB Type-C receptacle and adherence to USB power delivery standard, which is compulsory from the 28th of December 2024 for most products and the 28th of April 2026 for laptops. Another notable change in both the UK and the EU is their developments to cybersecurity. We'll touch on this in more detail a bit later on in the webinar. So in summary, both the UK and EU present unique challenges and opportunities in the regulatory landscape for wireless products. This now wraps up everything in the LATAM and EMEA regions. I hope you found this useful. I will now hand you back to Charlotte to discuss the next regions. Thanks, Kate. As outlined at the start, we'll now be kicking off our review with the APAC and CIS regions before closing things off with some cybersecurity updates. So let's start with Australia. In, um, sorry. Uh, starting in March, the Australian regulator ACMA initiated a public consultation focusing on proposed changes to future spectrum management and frequency allocation for the next five years. The primary goals include facilitating the ongoing deployment of 5G, 6G and Wi-Fi 6, as well as addressing the evolving Wi-Fi uh, requirements for cellular vehicle to everything and considerations arising from increased electrical integration into vehicles. Post consultation, steps have been taken to monitor and review the 6 gigahertz spectrum, potentially expanding the Wi Fi 6C allocation to cover the entire 6 gigahertz band, which is currently limited to 5925 to 6425 megahertz. But anticipate a consultation in the second quarter of next year for further updates on this front. Building on these initiatives, ACMA released another consultation in August addressing the use of the extended mobile satellite service L band in the 1.5 gigahertz band. Deliberations explored the potential utilization of the two listed bands. Now, while there hasn't been an official update to the regulations thus far, we are actively monitoring development in this area. Currently, an ongoing consultation revolves around the existing EMC requirements in Australia, set to conclude later this month on the 20th of December. Proposed changes include expanding the accepted EMC standards to align more closely with EU's directives, and in line with earlier consultations, they're also seeking feedback on whether the current regulations sufficiently address the risks in vehicles, but they're also reviewing risk classifications for specific devices, including removing low powered inductive power transfer devices like wireless chargers for phones and electronic wearables from the high risk category and potentially lowering the risk level for certain household devices too. Now, moving on from Australia, we head north to China. Starting with announcement number 69, which was released this year to regulate wireless charging equipment becoming effective at the beginning of September. To comply with this regulation, mobile and portable wireless charging equipment should operate in the listed frequency bands with a maximum rated output power not exceeding 80 watts. Wireless charging equipment for electrical vehicles is also addressed in this regulation. In March, the Chinese National Certification and Accreditation Administration published an announcement regarding the requirements for lithium ion batteries and similar devices, such as power adapters and chargers for telecommunications terminal equipment. Starting from the 1st of August this year, these products must now obtain CCC certification with a one year transition period cur currently in place, after which uncertified products are not permitted to leave the factory for sale, import or use in any other business activities. Additionally, China very recently began regulating IPv6 as well, releasing Notice 174 at the end of September, with the regulation taking effect on the 1st of December. This notice mandates that wireless LAN equipment with public IP address allocation functions must now support IPv6. Currently, this only applies to mass devices with client devices not falling under the scope of this regulation. For manufacturers who do fall into the scope of this, devices already imported or produced before the 1st of December can still be sold and used, but compliance testing is required going forward for products manufactured after this date. Continuing on from an earlier change in 2022, the Ministry of Industry and Information Technologies Regulation number 129 became mandatory from the 15th of October this year. 
Any manufacturer with devices approved to the earlier standards must now retest to this new standard. Otherwise, their current approval will expire on the 31st of December 2025, irrespective of any other listed expiry date. For new products and those requiring retesting, the most significant change from this regulation was the introduction of adaptivity testing and amendments to spurious emission limits for some bands. While there are several other changes in China, um, as we have only got one hour with you today, due to time constraints, we're going to give you a very quick overview of some of the final key updates before moving on to Hong Kong. So to start off, the NAL and SR SRRC schemes updated their labelling requirements, which both became effective this month. For NAL, the manufacturers will need to update their labels in line with the new format shown, whereas SRRC only affects approvals issued from this month onwards. So on we move to Hong Kong. Cellular technologies took centre stage this year. In March, the Office of Communications Authority released their new standard TAC012, specifically for 5G new radio repeater equipment or type 1C repeaters operating in the frequency bands below 6 GHz. The introduction of the standard mandates that such equipment must comply with the listed 3GPP standard to be operated in Hong Kong. Later in the year, on the 11th, 18th of July, sorry, the OFCA um, it issued revised versions of the listed standards. These updates bring about changes to the requirements for cellular devices operating on LTE, particularly on EUTRA and FDD. Notably, the pair band 703 to 738 MHz and 758 to 793 MHz were included in these updated standards. Furthering the focus on cellular and also in July, the Communication Authority and the Secretary for Commerce and Economic Development initiated a public consultation on assigning the bands listed on the slide for 5G. Building on this consultation, the OFCA issued an updated spectrum release plan in August, outlining intentions to open these bands for use in 2025. So a little wait for those, but for now we move on to India. In India, the regulatory landscape has witnessed notable transformations, particularly with the Telecommunication Engineering Centre marked marked by their ongoing rollout of the mobile type certification testing equipment scheme, which is called the Tech Scheme for short. At the onset of this year, Tech issued a notification advising that safety reports and certificates from India BIS recognised laboratories can be used to demonstrate compliance with Tech safety requirements um, under the relevant essential requirements. This somewhat reduces the cost and the testing requirements for, for this notoriously expensive and test heavy scheme. So good news there. But as the year unfolded, Tech announced the acceptance of applications for Wi-Fi consumer premises equipment and IP routers starting from July the 1st. However, changing the decision on this, the Tech emerged later in the year with a deadline for mandatory applications extended to January 2024. Furthermore, Tech issued another notification extended the mandatory deadline for equipment falling under phases three and four of the scheme. Products falling under these phases originally had a deadline of the 1st of October. However, this was later extended in September to the end of this year. Optical fiber products also received an exemption until the close of 2023. Delving into tech initiatives, in July, phase five was also introduced and products in scope will require mandatory testing and certification from the 30th of June, 2024. Products certified before this date can leverage report from an ILAC accredited testing laboratory, such as one of two SUDs, after which local testing becomes mandatory. Shifting focus to another regulatory body in India, the Department of Telecommunications started the year by releasing an updated version of the National Frequency Allocation Plan. Key changes include the addition of the listed bands to the license exempt frequency ranges, catering to the needs of IoT and M2M devices. Additionally, nearly 17 gigahertz of new bands was allocated for 5G across the spectrum, reflecting India's commitment to the advancing telecommunications technology. In summary, as you can see from the number of extensions and changes, businesses aiming to introduce products in India in 2024 should be prepared for a very dynamic regulatory environment. And on that note, we're now turning our attention to Indonesia. At the beginning of the year, the regulator SDPPI initiated a public consultation on mandatory SAR testing for telecommunication equipment. Subsequently, in August, a new regulation was issued mandating in-country SAR testing effective from the 1st of December this year. In November, TUFSU did meet with SDPPI in person, where we both ex expressed concerns about the feasibility of implementing SAR testing due to a shortage of local labs with SAR capability. 
In response, SDPPI indicated a potential postponement of this requirement. However, um, and ongoing discussions aim for the regulator to continue accepting SAR reports from SDPPI accredited labs, for example, outside of Indonesia, and we'll keep you informed as soon as we receive any updates on this. As of yet, local SAR testing is still required in line with the regulation. Beyond SAR, there have been several public consultations throughout the year, and we're awaiting SDPPI's feedback on these matters. Starting in July with a consultation covering the requirements for UWB, wireless power transmission and intelligent transport systems, and then closing off with a consultation focusing on non-cellular low power wide area network devices. A key change proposed is that certain frequencies must be permanently locked to ensure operation only within the, the permitted bands. This change mostly affects RFID products operating in the 900 megahertz bands. So now we shift our focus to Japan. The Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications has been actively engaging in regulatory reviews this year, particularly in the realm of LP1, much like Indonesia. In July, um, MIC opened a public consultation to assess the requirements of these devices. Although the consultation concluded in August, no new changes have been implemented thus far. Also in July, MIC released a consultation regarding the partial re revision of the Ordinance for Wireless LAN. This included the exploration of a system enabling the use of European and US test standard data for reviewing technical standards and test methods for 2.4 gigahertz wireless LAN. This strategic move is a potential, uh, shows a potential alignment of Japanese standards with those of ETSI and FCC. And following this consultation, MIC has now confirmed that they are proceeding with this and we are now able to use EU test data to generate reports against Arab standards, reducing costs and lead times for everybody. Building on an already busy July, MIC introduced amendments to several ordinances which aim to introduce, um, an, introduce narrow band LTE advanced into Japan, permitting the use of the following frequencies which can be seen on the slide. These amendments came into force on the 29th of August. In another recent development, MIC also issued further amendments to ordinances 14 and 18 last month. These changes expanded the permitted frequency bands for DECT and TD LTE Digital. As of the 10th of November, the listed changes are now in effect. Next, we move to Lao. The Ministry of Technology and Communications implemented significant changes in the regulatory landscape in March with brand new changes to their approvals process. This um, update categorizes equipment into two distinct groups, type one and type two, with type one products now requiring certification and notification and type two products becoming exempt, just requiring notification. Then in July, the MTC issued notice 416, which came into effect on the 4th of August, introducing changes to the, to the validity for both type one and type two products, with type one being valid for three years and type two being valid for one year only. Finally, the MTC announced that certain products must now also affix a physical label to their products. Um, manufacturers unable to affix the label can request special permission to place it in the user manual or opt for an e-label, but all labels need to be obtained directly from the regulator. Uh, but for now, we're moving on to Malaysia. On the 28th of August, the Malaysian Commission Communications and Multimedia Commission released class announcement number one, outlining class assignments for unlicensed radio products. Key changes include an adjustment for it to allow higher output powers and indoor use of short range devices and the inclusion of inductive application devices. Another focal point in Malaysia this year revolves around the evolving IPv6 requirements. Malaysia stands out as a leader in this regard, already mandating IPv6 compliance reports. However, recognising the ongoing development globally, for this, the regulator has extended that interim type approval for IPv6 cellular equipment for an additional year, effective from the 10th of July 2023. This extension accommodates manufacturers who don't have evidence of IPv6 compliance to continue obtaining approvals with one year validities. Next. Papua New Guinea witnessed several regulatory changes throughout this year, starting with the new regulation ICT Equipment Type Approval Rule of 2022. Notably, there's a shift in certificate validities with approvals now valid for a duration of three years. Next, on the 12th of May, NICTA initiates a public consultation regarding bands 41 and 78. Following this consultation, on the 10th of November, NICTA announced the official permission for these bands in Papua New Guinea and works now underway to update the National Frequency Allocation Plan to reflect these changes. Finally, in Vanuatu, the, regulation, 
the regulatory landscape saw a notable development from the regulator telecommunications, radio communications and broadcasting regulator. On the 17th of March, TRBR issued a notice which became immediately effective and brings, us, brings a significant change by exempting Bluetooth only devices from type approval. Going forwards, any device solely utilising Bluetooth technology is no longer subject to type approval. However, it's crucial to know that devices incorporating additional technologies alongside Bluetooth will, no, will still be required to undergo the standard type approval process. And now we move to Singapore. Singapore had a lot of regulatory changes this year, starting with an update on short range devices, which became effective on the 1st of September. The main change was the approval of Wi-Fi 6E. Uh, this update followed an earlier public consultation in the year regarding changes to these specifications. In addition to this, the Infocom Media Development Authority released a consultation in September opening the technical specifications for cellular base station and repeater systems for public comment. Following this, on the 9th of November, the IMDA issued their final regulation or uh, revision of these specifications. Main changes include the addition of band 26 and rated output power limits according to base station classes with the relevant ETSI and FCC standards added to align products against. July saw an announcement from the IMDA about plans to shut down the 3G network in Singapore, effective from the 31st of July, 2024. Starting from the 1st of February next year, the IMDA will deregister all 3G only mobile terminals and non voice over LTE mobile phones and smartphones. Manufacturers are prohibited from selling any 3G only devices from February onwards, and must ensure that devices with 3G capabilities can operate on other bands from July next year. But for now, we're going to Thailand. On the 28th of April, the National Broadcasting and Telecommunications Commission released two notifications. These opened up the frequency bands for the use of Wi-Fi 6E in the country. Following this development, a meeting was convened by the MBTC in June to address the new Wi-Fi 6E requirements, in addition to clarifications on output powers and indoor and outdoor restrictions, they clarified that devices exclusively supporting Wi-Fi 6E will be subject to a declaration conformity only. However, devices supporting both WAN and Wi-Fi 6E must undergo approval under Class B. In February of the same year, MBTC introduced a revamp of the SDOC format. Going forwards, SDOC submission will all be digitally signed, enhancing the efficiency and security of the certification process. Concluding our review of the APAT region, we now shift focus to Vietnam. The, so the Ministry of Information and Communications issued Circular 04 2023, replacing a circular from the previous year, 02. This circular underwent a subsequent revision in September, evolving into Circular 10 23, due to a lack of test, local testing capacity. Following this revision, key changes include the introduction of various new standards, a regulatory shift of specific products where a declaration of conformity is now only required, and the implementation of extreme testing conditions for the products falling under these listed standards, which was deferred until 2024 in June. Two other key changes include 5G NR requirements and notes on validities for approvals that were issued against the April circular. In July, MIC embarked on two additional public consultations concerning the International Mobile to Telecommunications System. The first consultation focused on the strategic planning for the 3560 to 4000 megahertz band, concluding its comment period on the 30th of August. Simultaneously, the second consultation addressed planning of the frequency bands for 1920 to 1980 megahertz and 211 to megahertz, concluding a few days later on the 4th of September. It's worth noting, however, that as of now, no formal decisions have been made regarding these frequencies. So to conclude our review, let's shift our focus to the CIS. Now, it's important to note that due to international sanctions currently in place, we are unable to delve into any regulatory changes in Belarus or Russia. Consequently, our discussions could be centred on the remaining countries in the region. Throughout this year, the regulatory landscape in the CIS countries experienced a relatively tranquil period marked by minimal alterations. However, a noteworthy mention is the Eurasian Customs Union, who updated their EMC and safety regulations to expand the number of products falling into scope. So going forward, make sure to check these regulations before you start importing. In Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, some updates were also issued. 
However, it's crucial to highlight that these changes predominantly constituted administrative adjustments, yielding little to no impact on current processes. So that concludes the main summary of the regu global regulations across all regions. So there's one topic, as I mentioned before, I want to cover before we bring back in Kate and move to questions. And that topic is uh, that affects all regions, and that is cybersecurity. Now, there have been an increasing number of threats against IoT devices in recent years. A great example of this is the Mirai botnet attack, which was a type of malware that targeted consumer IoT devices to perform a DDoS attack against high profile targets. Due to these increasing threats, governments globally are luckily taking IoT cybersecurity very seriously. So far, there are a number of mandatory and voluntary regulations around the world which are used to improve the cybersecurity of IoT devices. One such standard is EN 303645 for consumer IoT devices and is a reference in countries in, such as Brazil, Singapore, India, the UK and of course the EU. This standard offers the minimum baseline security, however, manufacturers of IoT devices should definitely consider performing security assessments over and above this baseline. Now, Europe is leading the way with the, in introducing the Commission Delegated Regulation 2022-30, which addresses products falling under the Radio Equipment Directive. Delays, however, have pushed the application date right out to the 1st of August 2025. But three harmonised standards are also under development, addressing specific aspects of radio equipment security. There's also a proposal underway for horizontal cybersecurity requirements, namely the Cyber Resilience Act which will consist of cybersecurity requirements for products with digital elements. So this will cover more products than under red and likely will be in force in 2027. In the UK, the, issue, the government issued a new Product Security and Telecommunications Infrastructure Act, mandating cybersecurity requirements for consumer IoT devices. The secondary regulation to this, which was released this year, covers the security requirements for relevant connectable products and takes effect on the 29th of April 2024. Now, unlike UKCR K marking, which was pushed out, compliance with PSTI will require a statement of compliance. The US is also taking measures to improve IoT security, as outlined in the recent announcements in the Biden Harris administration. Here at Tusted UK, we have a great team offering testing and assessment for cybersecurity of consumer and non consumer IoT devices. So, do get in touch if you are interested in this. So, thank you for all for listening to all these major changes that have occurred over 2023. I know that was a huge amount of information to take in, but we hope you found this session very useful. Uh, if you have any questions on any of the regular changes we have covered, then please don't hesitate to get in touch. But for those of you who have already put your questions in, let's take a look at them now and bring back in Kate. So Kate, what questions do we have so far? Um, there was one I just saw a minute ago that was asking about the new regulatory update for Mexico on low power devices. Um, so yes, alongside the consultation I mentioned earlier for Mexico, the authority issued a draft technical provision for um, low power radio communication devices in the range 30 megahertz to 3 gigahertz. Uh, the draft mentions specifications, limits and test methods. I believe you can make comments until the same date as the other consultation I mentioned, so that would be the end of January 2024 to 29th. Um, once the authority issues further information next year, we'll make sure we can let you know on all of our platforms and let off uh, clients know by email. Ah, cool. Well, next one I can see is um, one from that we've got about a Bluetooth speaker. We have a Bluetooth speaker which has simple pairing and connection function. Should it comply with the cybersecurity requirements in the EU and the US? Now, as I mentioned with the EU, currently um, there's a there's EN 303645. Um, from my recollection, um, it's something you should definitely be taking a look at and um, in complying with, it's always better to be safe to sorry and check, um, and the very least do some sort of minimal checks to ensure that you are, are complying with at least the baseline security um, applications. Okay. I've got one here that says that you've mentioned a lot of wireless schemes. Are there any safety updates you haven't mentioned that we need to be aware of? Um, yeah, great question. As we only sadly had so much time today, we're unable to highlight um, a lot of safety updates. But there was a good one in Singapore, as in January, the Consumer Product Safety Office issued a circular outlining changes to the renewal process for the certificates of conformity issued by the CPSO, which was effective from the end of June this year. 
um, where the CPSO is no longer issuing COCs directly um, if there are other certification bodies that have the relevant scope. So manufacturers looking to renew these COCs need to contact the CPSO or a CB such as to Sud Singapore um, to identify the appropriate certification body. So for controlled goods though, CPSO will continue to renew those approvals directly and then on the note of CPSO, they are also now mandating that AC adapters must comply with edition four of IEC 62368. Um, and this will apply for all new and renewal applications. Um, next question is, um, does the UK P PTSI Act also apply to land devices which are designed for business use rather than consumer? Um, I, from my understanding, it's currently consumer devices, but it can never hurt to comply with that as well. But I will check with our cybersecurity team and get that confirmed for you 100%. Um, Someone's also um, asking for a copy of the slides. Uh, so now, because you've joined the webinar today, you should receive an email link um, email with a link, sorry, and then you should have the recorded version of the webinar so you can access it there. So do look out for um, that. And then if you don't see, check your spam, but if you don't receive anything, you can give us an email on the emails now that is currently on the slide and we can get back to you and send you a link to the webinar. You should get receive an email about that. Yep. Um, another question, are cybersecurity requirements going to be retrospective? What about industrial machining that can be connected to networks? Great question. Um, it's likely going to be it possibly applies the ones that you're placing on the market from the date the regulation becomes effective um but as i said we will check with our cyber security team and double confirm that for you um got another one sorry on um argentina um has there been any updates to w1 testing so um as of yet there's the authority haven't issued any information about w1 testing in the country um it's something that i think we thought would come in this year um, but it's taken a little bit longer than we thought. So I think there's definitely something to look out for next year. And it's going to uh, there's going to be a lot of changes on that. But obviously, as we've mentioned throughout the webinar, once we receive these changes or get notified by the authority, we will update you as soon as we hear anything. Fab, cool. Next question is, what do you think the bigger change is going to be in 2024? Very good question. Um, for me, I think one of the biggest changes we'll continue to see is the phasing out of 2G and 3G networks worldwide to allow for the more advanced 4G, 5G and maybe even 6G networks. Um, I think we'll continue to see developments across the globe in relation to Wi-Fi 6E and countries allowing the entire uh, Wi-Fi 6E band instead of just allowing partial allocation like you've seen in some of the LATAM countries. Um, also, Towards the end of this year, um, I've been seeing a lot more updates and changes regarding um, Internet Protocol version 6 or IPv6. And there's been a lot of changes in the APAC region, as Charlotte was mentioning earlier. So um, I believe we're going to see a lot more country developments around this topic and this system. So um, I think these for me are personally the ones to watch out for. But Charlotte, I don't know if you want to add any more on that. No, I think you've covered a lot of really good points there. But I think in terms of technology, it's also countries you need to look out for. If you're selling in China and if you're selling in India, um, they're ones to really watch out for the climate changes. But another one that you mentioned, the public consultation in Mexico that's coming up, um, that's currently underway. They're looking at regulating the more of the five gigahertz wireless LAN bands. So um, the public consultation says that um, anyone that's started their press certification or is certified prior to the date, you don't need to um, recertify, but anybody else needs to start thinking about testing um, on the additional 5 gigahertz band that they currently don't regulate under NOM 208. Um, and I think um, the other question was, uh, EN 303 605 is not a harmonized standard in the EU. Any regulation we should comply in the EU. Um, as best of my recollection, yes, it's not harmonised yet, um, but um, it's one you should probably be looking at comply with. Um, as I said, the current mandatory standard has been pushed out to 2025, so any decision you make right now is voluntary. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, um, and I think that is all the questions yeah. we have that we're all able to answer today. Any ones we haven't answered, um, we'll uh, email you with a full and clear response.